Inclusive excellence as a framework really is probably the best way to understand it. Developed to kind of redefine excellence in the academy as inclusivity. It's really about how do we move from just numbers to kind of reimagining the culture and the Mm. structures or policies so that it's a responsibility of everyone, inclusive of administration, faculty, students, staff, everybody who kind of touches the university and community. Hello and welcome. I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told. And today I invite you to join me in conversation with Dr. Emily Rudder as we take a communication perspective on inclusive excellence in education and all that that means. To take a communication perspective is to consider what we're making and how we're making it through our communication practices. This means we look closely at patterns, context, stories, and relationships, and that we use curiosity, mindfulness, collaboration, and dialogue to create better social worlds. Whether the topic of today's conversation is familiar to you or not, the hope is that using a communication perspective will reveal new ways of seeing and being. At the top of the episode, you heard our conversation partner today, Dr. Emily Rudder. Emily is a former professor of mine at Ball State University. She's a professor of English, associate dean of the Honors College, and affiliate faculty in women's gender and African-American studies at Ball State University. She's also written and edited a ton, and I'll point you to the show notes to read more about her writing. This episode is the second in our education series. I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to speak with Emily. She was an important part of my academic journey in college, and she herself has a kind of unique perspective on education and the world of academia because of the path she has taken in life, which you'll get to hear about today. Most importantly, this conversation speaks to the intersection of education and stories and the power that stories have in our lives to propel us forward or hold us back. So let's continue the conversation with Emily. Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation today. Hi, Abby. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see you again, since obviously we have crossed paths at Ball State. And I'm so glad that you're joining me for this conversation today to explore conversations that Well, some things that we've kind of discussed together before in the classes that I took with you, but also some things, some stories from your life that I haven't got to hear about. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, to start, I always like to have my guests introduce themselves, specifically thinking about the context of this conversation, which is that it will be part of a series on education. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to ask for you to start your introduction of yourself with stories about your education as a student in the many ways you've been a student, but also in roles you've had as educator, administrator, and now associate dean of the Ball State Honors College. So wherever you'd like to start, please introduce yourself. Yeah, okay. Well, I am, as you said, I'm currently a professor of English and associate dean of the Honors College at Ball State. I'm also an affiliate faculty member in Women's Gender and African American Studies, which is a department that I helped establish. My educational background uh, is kind of interesting, I guess. I am probably one of the few people you'll meet who has a GED and a PhD. (laughs) So I left high school when I was 16, almost 17, and then got my GED, had some pretty significant personal challenges, uh, and, you know, kind of grew up in an environment that was in many ways, really shaped by kind of social consciousness and, you know, social justice commitments, but also mental health issues and and a a significant amount of trauma too. So kind of, you know, some, some troubled, (laughs) troubled times, Mm -hmm. Uh, left high school and got my GED and then ended up going to community college and then transferring into UNC Chapel Hill, which I'm from the Chapel Hill Durham area. So um, that was the kind of hometown university. And then uh, those educational experiences have been interesting in the sense that as somebody who was sort of on the outside looking in, in a lot of ways, but now is in a position of a lot of kind of educational privilege as yeah. you know, somebody who has a doctorate and, you know, I'm full professor, associate dean, all these things, you know, so I've sort of been on polar 
ends of the educational spectrum in a lot of different ways. So, you know, I guess that gives me a particular kind of purchase on education. I also, when I graduated from undergrad before um, pursuing my master's and PhD, I taught high school in a high poverty, predominantly black high school in, in Eastern North Carolina. And that really shaped my experiences that actually led me to kind of pursue my graduate work in African-American literature, which is what I teach mostly now. So that experience, like sort of being a teacher, but also seeing how systemic injustices work in public education, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that really sort of did a couple of things. I think one, it put my own experiences in kind of sharp relief. Like I, I think I had thought of myself as sort of disadvantaged in some way. And I think being in that environment highlighted some significant privileges I'd had in terms yeah, of, yeah. you know, my, my whiteness, um, even growing up in a kind of low income environment, what I thought it was low income <laughs> was very different. I see. You know what I mean? I, you know, yes. what I was thinking of is sort of like, you know, blue collar, I mean, my, my mother lives on disability. So I mean, I, you know, I have a particular purchase on poverty, but it's different when you're mm-hmm. in generational poverty in an area of mm-hmm. North Carolina that was shaped by enslavement. and Jim Yeah, Crow. right. So those experiences kind of gave me yet another vantage point on education. Um, so I think like in my current work, I'm bringing all of that in, you know, all of that is kind of funneled in and I think I've seen with my own life, but also with my students that, I mean, education really does transform lives. I mean, that that's, you know, maybe a pat phrase, but it's true. So I think, you know, that that's sort of the why of what I do. It's like, you know, education can be absolutely transformative. And so, you know, that, that keeps me motivated. And I think I've seen that again from my own life, but also in working with students in this, you know, variety of different capacities, I've really seen that bear out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you kind of took us to that place, because I do also think that's true. Education transforms lives. And I think the thing that takes that statement from being a kind of platitude or cliche kind of thing is the real experiences and stories you can hear from people. And so I'm curious if you could elaborate on your own or like you're saying, experience that you've had with other students of how have you seen education transform lives? Yeah, you know, I had an experience. Um, last fall that uh, just, you know, kind of came like a a bolt out of the blue. And I I just, I'm still sort of marveling at it. Um, We had an event here that was sort of bringing together alumni uh, who who had been Whitinger scholars. Um, I don't know if you remember that scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. And so a student I had worked and they were getting up and, and sort of talking about their experiences and what they learned and where they are now. And a student who I had worked with, not particularly closely, like didn't know her as well as I knew you kind of thing, Mm -hmm. right? She stood up and talked about being, she's a nurse and um, she works in the delivery room and she was talking about healthcare inequities. And then, you know, she called out my class and said, you know, I learned so much about intersectionality and anti-racism and Dr. Redder's class. And that has helped shape my whole career as a nurse. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, again, it was one of those things that was so, such a wonderful thing to say. Um, it, and it, I don't think it was really about me, but it was just like, I was a right. conduit. Yes. Like I, you know, I had, it was a class that was a lot about intersectionality. So it was a lot about how there's intersecting forms of structural oppression. And, you know, that that's coming out of um, a tr- tradition of Black women pointing that out and the way that it particularly impacts Black women. And she really absorbed that information when, and was able to immediately kind of apply it in um, the healthcare industry, which is, of course, riddled with those kinds of intersectional inequities. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, wow, you know, I never in a million years would have thought that this particular student even, (laughs) you know, that this would be impacting her so much. You just never know, I guess. Right. You know, some students I'll stay in touch with. And so, you know, we'll continue to sort of be in conversation, but I just don't always know what the impact is. So that, that was just a a really gratifying moment. And Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have some, a couple of friends in the community here 
who um, I work with on like the Juneteenth committee, for example, and they're maybe a little bit younger than me, but they're, you know, they're not college age, but I've kind of invited them into some of my African-American studies classes. And, you know, and so then we, we've talked about how they learned things about, they're both black women. They learned things about black experiences, black history, black literature, whatever, that they didn't have purchase on before those classes, Yeah, you know? And so, which is interesting because of course, you know, they, they're bringing all kinds of knowledge to the classroom space as well that I don't have access to, right. As somebody who's not living my life as a black person, but just the way that, that education provides a space to learn about your own identity Mm -hmm. that might actually be sort of denied in dominant culture. Right. So I think those examples also point to the way that the the classroom is really more of an, a space of exchange rather mm-hmm. than kind of top down or like the stage on a stage. You know, it's a place where students are bringing all of these experiences and I'm bringing information and experiences and ways of knowing. And it's like the interplay between those things that really allows us to co-construct knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, as you tell that story, I'm thinking about my own memory of interacting with you and I can picture, well, you know, part of my undergrad was during COVID. So I can picture myself sitting in my dorm room on a zoom call. (laughs) And I believe I was in a class with you at the time that was also happening virtually, but I I think this was like a separate event, probably during black history month, a like series of events. And I remember being on a call that you were leading with a group of students and there's just the conversation that happened and the kind of engagement and that felt like one of the first spaces that I was in of like, we are gathering one, it was just outside of a class. So we're choosing to show up to this call based on the topics of anti-racism and bias that was, you know, the way it was marketed, I'm sure was like, that was the title of whatever the kind of conversation mm-hmm. was going to be about. It was you kind of leading us through that. And we did little breakout rooms and I heard from other people and it was just like one of those first like meaningful experiences of like, oh, this is what it can look like Mm -hmm. to engage. And I thought that was really meaningful. You talk about that co-constructing. And so that that was a really meaningful experience for me to be like, come here, come here, like be a part of this Mm -hmm. and participate. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that that's kind of my maybe parallel of that student story of that, like that was meaningful for me and stuck with me in terms of like, okay, this is a model of like how I want to engage in conversations, especially about race and bias. I don't know if this feels like an awkward question to ask, but I'm really curious to know how do students or people react or interact with you as a white teacher teaching African-American studies? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I mean, I guess that's, yeah, that's kind of a multi-layered question, but I'll, I'll get into all the layers. I mean, like I said, I sort of chose to pursue this field after teaching in a predominantly black high school and kind of my students being really eager to learn about black literature instead of like a standard curriculum of, yeah. And, you know, um, a lot of British writer, a lot of white British writers. And so that, but then, you know, I loved that. I loved that experience, but I also had some self-awareness of like, you know, I I don't really know what I'm doing. (laughs) I mean, I, you know, I love this literature. I think I know how to teach literature, but I don't Mm -hmm. really have the educational background, right. you know, to do this justice. And and so that led me into getting my master's and my PhD. And, you know, I, and Alex published several books and lots of articles and all those things. So, I mean, I think that, you know, what, one of the things I like to be clear about in the classroom is like, I'm bringing kind of a wealth of intellectual knowledge about these topics, but I, and, and that's like the benefit of me being here. Mm-hmm. The limitation is that I, am no expert in the lived experience of what it means to be black in America. And, you know, I think in a way that is actually, again, that's sort of where, you know, we, we can talk about it being an exchange because, you know, yeah, right. students, it's like what, but they're bringing maybe something that's about lived experience. Yes. Um, and so that's a really helpful thing to sort of empower students to say, you know, you have a lot of agency here, but we can sort of, you know, teach each other. But then I also think, you know, it's like, 
African-American literature or black studies or women's and gender studies or, you know, Native American studies or whatever, all of these studies are really any discipline. I mean, they're disciplines. They're, you know, it's a set of traditions and peer reviewed research, you know, an extensive, in the case of, of black literature, an extensive literary tradition that stretches back centuries. And you, because you are a person of color doesn't mean that you already know all those things, right? Like, yeah, so it's yeah. like, it's also important, I think, to think about that we don't, just like you train to become a biologist, you train to become an expert in African-American literature. And we need to recognize that because we need to recognize it as the legitimate field that it is. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, an important point for students, an important thing for like for all students to recognize, and I think all of us living in this country, is that, you know, Black history is American history. Black literature is American literature. Mm -hmm. these, these aren't these like, you know, esoteric ideas or, you know, ways of thinking that, I mean, while they are often pushed to the margins, they're really at the center of what it means to understand um, this country and how it works. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I also frame it that way. Like we all have a stake in this and, but we're coming in, we need to write, we all have a stake in this, but we also need to recognize, you know, where our different standpoints are mm -hmm. <laughs> and not pretend that, you know, just because we, I, just because I have all this intellectual knowledge, I'm on the same plane as, as a black right. person, you know, it, living in this country, but, but that like our standpoints are critical to recognize, but that we all have a stake in, in black history and black literature. So I think all of those elements kind of are, are necessary to the framework with which I'm operating. Right. And, and I should also say too, Abby, that, you know, one of the things I write about frequently is, is actually how black literature represents whiteness. Um, so, or, or black film or you know, even television I've kind of expanded into. So mm -hmm. it's not just like I'm writing about the way that blackness is being represented mm -hmm. or the way that race is being represented. I'm, I actually, you know, like to turn it, turn the gaze and say, well, how, how does black literature represent dominance and that experience? So, uh, and, and in that way, I'm sort of looking at myself, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so it's, so it's like, again, that just shows you the way that we kind of all have some kind of stake or purchase on these issues or these texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely something that I walked away from classes that I took with you experiencing is um, just that deepening, yeah, personal investment in it to see myself more and more as being, yeah, involved as being a stakeholder is essentially just, yeah, seeing the mattering of it in my own life and then the way that I can act into that. My background being this communication perspective, I'm always so curious to know kind of what people's experience with communication has been or kind of what you've learned of communication as it relates to your specific field of studies and teaching and work. And specifically, I'd be curious to know about you engaging white students on topics about racism and bias, anti-racism and bias to know what is, what's kind of the communicating that's emerged there? What have you kind of noticed or learned about really what effective communication and maybe ineffective communication mm -hmm. looks like in those spaces? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the key piece, maybe this kind of goes back to what you're just saying is that, you know, to recognize, like, we all have skin in the game. Yeah. Just, you know, just from just like, that's foundational, you know, that nobody gets an out, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're, we're all coming, we are all racialized. We're all gendered. We're all classed, you know, we're all sexualized. Like these are things, you know, whether you're able-bodied or have a disability or whatever, mm -hmm. you're, we're all swimming in those things or none of us can escape that. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's that self-awareness I think is absolutely critical. So I, one of the things I certainly try to work on in my own life and, and in the classroom is just bringing that self-awareness, right? Like who, who am I in this space? And I think in terms of once you recognize that the communication can become a lot easier. Yeah. Um, 
because you know when you're using the eye voice, you know, where you're actually coming from. But I think that establishing common agreements using that civic dialogue model of, okay, we're not here to have a debate necessarily. We're here to actually be in conversation. Yeah. So what does it mean to have a conversation? Like, what do you, what are the rules of the game in a conversation? You know, mm-hmm. and it is things like speaking from the eye perspective, not using slurs, not reading them aloud, just yeah. <laughs> checking those at the door, not thinking about individuals as representatives of social groups, whether that's a marginalized group or a dominant group, mm-hmm. you know, you know, we are socialized in the patterns of behavior. So that's part of the social groups we're part of, but we are individuals. So we can't be representatives or asked to speak for. Yeah. Um, I think the stepping up and stepping back is another crucial part of that communication. You know, some people need a lot of processing time, so they don't necessarily feel like they want to step up or contribute right away, but finding ways to make sure that everyone can be part of the conversation, but also that nobody is just totally dominating it. Yeah. I mean, it is very, tr- that is a very tricky balance. Um, but I think being, I don't, I, I guess I don't think in a classroom or any other space that you can bring a group of people together and expect that they're going to know those civic dialogue, common agreements already. Yeah. I think you have to be really deliberate about it and say, okay, what are the most productive conversations you've had about difficult topics? Why were they productive? You know, let's, let's map out some of the things that we're going to agree upon that are going to help these conversations to be that way. And then I think, you know, when incidents or kind of infractions on those agreements occur, you like, you do, you have to stop and you have to say like, okay, I'm not sure if that's following our common agreement. So let's talk about why that happened. You know, I, I, I really think that we have to be, we have to come together with a sort of covenant about how this is going to go. And then we have to stay true to it and we have to be vulnerable and acknowledge, you know, when it's not working. So for me, that that's kind of key in terms of like, okay, how, how, what, what is the communication around a difficult topic or something that is often controversial, mm-hmm. you know, like the main thing is just figuring out how you're going to talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. That I can, again, totally picture myself in a zoom class with you in the first day talking about what are our rules of engagement? What do we want to be true? I remember specifically talking about like calling people in versus calling people out and using that kind of language. Mm-hmm. And as you're speaking, I'm just convinced more and more that, wow, it's so meaningful to kind of use a communication perspective to look at these kinds of conversations because the weight or the importance of these topics does kind of require a real intentionality about how you're showing up. And we could learn so much from that and apply it to all of our conversations because that's everything that a communication perspective says is that, you know, our communication creates our social worlds, the quality of our communication in a ways determines the quality of our social world. And so through the stories we're telling and through the meaning we're making, that's how we're creating our reality and what we know to be true and what we believe to be true for ourselves and what we can imagine for ourselves. And so if we can be intentional in the way that you're asking people and teaching people to be in the classroom and in other avenues, if we can take that to all of our conversations and all of our relationships and interactions, I think that'd be so meaningful. Because I think mm-hmm. that that shared expectation piece, that checking in with each other about are we bumping up against any boundaries right now, like that is such a, it seems like such a loving way to be in relationship with each other. And I just truly believe like if we could take some of that, yeah, intention that mm-hmm. these kind of conversations require to many of our interactions, that that would be, you know, a, make a really good social world for us. Yeah, it'd be transformative for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm just reflecting on what you're saying because I'm thinking about how that the difference between, you know, when you, when I sort of set that up as almost a facilitator mm-hmm. and then you know, in my personal life, the way that like my family, for example, my immediate family, um, very political. And I mean, we all are essentially on the same page, but we find ways of like nitpicking, you know, it's, yes. it's, 
we're, we're, we're really, really close, but the, 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 you know, small sort of fractions of difference end up, you know, being blown up. And so, um, yeah, I guess another important takeaway is like, we, if we know that the kind of civic dialogue model is impactful, we know it's effective, then like, how can we import that into our personal lives mm -hmm. and our lives as well it's not just reserved for this you know sort of more scripted environment of yeah the yeah 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 that's that's really interesting and making me begin to think about another thing I want to talk about because this is language that you use and say is at the center of what you do which is inclusive excellence mm -hmm. and so I'm kind of curious about that relationship there as well of well maybe one what 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 is inclusive excellence how do you define that and then how do you make it in your communication in the way that you are in the world? Yeah. Well, inclusive excellence as a framework really is probably the best way to understand it. It was created by the AACNU, which is an association of American colleges and universities. And really, it was a framework developed to kind of redefine excellence in the academy as inclusivity. So mm -hmm. like instead of the measure of excellence being, you know, publications or yeah. you know, teaching awards or something, right? It's like, okay, what if we redefine excellence as, as inclusivity? And then another piece of it that I really appreciate is numbers are important. So demographic data is still important, but it's really about moving beyond numbers. That's like the, you know, maybe the first piece. And then mm -hmm. it's like, sort of, if we think about it as like a spectrum, it's like, where do we move? How do we move from just numbers to kind of reimagining the culture and the mm. structures or policies so that it's a very kind of systemic framework, you know, thinking more broadly and not just about, again, like numerical yeah. um, progress. And then I, I think the third part about inclusive excellence that's really helpful is the emphasis on it being the responsibility of everyone. So not like, you know, your chief diversity officer or a committee, yeah. but like the whole university from, you know, the president down to, you know, students down to like, you know, or not down, but inclusive, inclusive of administration, faculty, students, staff, everybody who kind of touches mm -hmm. um, the university and community. Because in my experience, it so often occurs that there's like a core group, you know, that kind of sees it as their responsibility. And then a lot of other people kind of, you know, not not really like just don't yeah. really think about it. And and that might not, and that isn't accusatory. It's just sort of like, maybe the framework hasn't been, they don't realize why mm -hmm. they should be invested or, you know, the benefits to them or, or that kind of the way that the framework is relevant is probably the better way to put it. But that piece of it, the responsibility of everyone that I think is really salient and necessary so, I mean, in terms of like operationalizing that, I mean, I just try to look at inclusive excellence as kind of the framework through which I operate more generally. And I guess, I guess for me, that often ends up being, of course, thinking about culture and structure, but also about like the questions we ask. So, you know, one question that I'm always thinking about is not, I think often we, the question is posed is bias present? <laughs> and I mm. like to change that to like, we know it's present. So how is it present? Yeah. And I think like inclusive excellence helps us kind of think about that. Okay. We know, we know it is, how is yeah. it happening? You know, and what is it touching? You know, how can we bring everyone together to understand the impact and just, you know, whose voices are prominent, who's not at the table, you know, how do we bring others in all of those questions? I think it's like, you know, inclusive excellence as a framework allows us to always ask those questions in a, in any scenario, whether it's, you know, on a committee, it's, you know, as you're designing your syllabus, you know, as you're writing an article, whatever the work is, those questions are always relevant. Yeah, that, that's really helpful to understand that as a framework, I think. I'm glad you say it like that. And it makes me think that it's such a great example of, of this meaning making piece that my work is a lot about, which is really what I hope is empowering people to see themselves as meaning-making creatures who get to 
deconstruct the meaning that has been handed to them and reconstruct new meaning, make new choices, tell new stories. There's even a specific model within the theory that I work with, which is called coordinated management of meaning is the theory CMM. And then this model is has been called the hierarchy model, but we're kind of rebranding right now. Actually, we want to call it the heterarchy model because that's, you know, a flexible hierarchy is yeah. hierarchy. And so it references these layers of context that shape us. And it, it's not so important for like, you need one, two, three, four, five, you know, most to least what's shaping you, mm-hmm. but just generally getting an idea of the fact that there are multiple layers of context, Mm -hmm. many different contexts that you're speaking into or speaking out of in any given moment. So recognizing that there is maybe a hierarchy or a hierarchy in different moments that will change and that you yourself can do a little bit of that reflexive work Mm -hmm. and say, well, what do I want my highest level context to be? Mm -hmm. Then you can act from there and make choices and communicate in a way that is aligned with what you, you know, you say your values are or what, what kind of better social world you say you want. And so that is reflective of what I'm hearing you say that choosing to define excellence as inclusive excellence is a way of making a different choice about what's your highest level context as a university, as an educator, as an individual. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I think when you think about leading with your values, which is a challenge, you know, we're all working in, I mean, not all, but many of us are working in institutions. (laughs) So about being value driven sometimes is hard because you're, you're running up against capitalist or financial kinds of constraints, things yeah. that may not be in total alignment with your values. So like, how do you remain value driven within a space that might not always align yeah. with values? And I just think that's a constant struggle. I don't think that there's like one solution to that, uh, but I just think it's like, you have to be cognizant of it and you have to be like aware of, you know, the agency you do have in that scenario And then I also think it's true that not everything we do in our jobs is like the work. Like there's other kinds of work. Yeah. (laughs) Tell me more about what you mean by that. I just mean that it's like your job is one, one avenue or one outlet. And then there's other sort of portals for different kinds of, of influence or work or, you know, action. So I think also to kind of have multiple, and I think about that a lot in terms of purpose, like it is really important to have purpose at work, but it's also important to have purpose outside of work. And I I think about that just maybe as somebody who like suffers from being a workaholic, (laughs) but so like, that's part of the reason I think about this all the time, but also just that it's just very common in American culture to like sort of have everything bound up and like what you Mm -hmm. do for a living. And so I guess I I've also tried to find some other like portals of purpose, we'll call them. Yeah. um, Aren't like directly related to, you know, my teaching or my scholarship or writing, you know, but are like other ways of making meaning, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that happen in a different kind of space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's interesting too, because I'm thinking about what for you as an educator, what is work for you is something different to your students, you know, and I can picture what it was like to be on a campus and live on campus and engage in conversation in the classroom or elsewhere. And it is this huge thing. And so it's interesting to see how those two worlds meet of, yeah, both work for you, but maybe for the other people you're engaging with, it's their education or it's, you know, extracurricular things, depending on how they're engaging. And that's what I love about communication so much is, and maybe this experience resonates for you in your field as well. I could sit in my classes and learn something and then leave and go use that. And so it felt so real and so applicable. And it felt like it mattered because I thought, you know, yes, the work that I do now is based on communication. That's awesome. But like you're saying, my parallel of that would be also, I try to be really intentional and how I'm showing up to my relationships outside of the work that I do and like yeah. really live the things that yeah, I talk about. Exactly. And I, I do find. I certainly have, you know, like gathered the evidence of like, wow, this really works. And that's why I feel really inspired to like empower other people around their communication. Because whenever I am able to set really clear expectations or do some meta communicating and talk about the meaning that's being made, that always feels like 
a superpower. And so it's one of those, Mm -hmm. like, it's to me, it's like a best kept secret. Like, why does everyone not, you know, why did I have to major in interpersonal communication, devote my academics to it, to get, to have this information, you know, it's like, everybody's communicating, everybody's in relationships. And so I think it would just help people out a ton to have the same tools that I have. And so that's why, you know, with the podcast, I want to talk about a number of different topics and apply communication to all of it to see how it really does show up everywhere. Yeah. It matters everywhere. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, as you're saying that, I'm just thinking like, you know, how it's really not a requirement of public education or even, you know, there's like one communications course that you have to take at Ball State and, you Mm -hmm. know, most programs have that one. It's mostly about public speaking more than small. And so, but you're, that, what you're saying is so true, which is like that, you know, interpersonal communication is for human beings. That's like our most, those are our most rewarding moments and also yeah. our most hot moments. Those yeah. are the things that I'll probably give us the most stress mm-hmm. and also the most joy. Like it's very yeah. paradoxical. And so just essential though. Yeah. And we yeah. can't just assume that everyone automatically has those tools. Those are learned behaviors. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 It is interesting to think about it from like a structural, but also like a personal relational perspective talk about, you know, inclusive excellence. I'm sure there are conversations that happen within institutions and larger organizations about how do we make this happen? But it is also something I would imagine that happens more on a relational level. Yeah. Um, Yeah, definitely. Like you've said, you've experienced education in many different Mm -hmm. ways and from many different perspectives based on, you know, your kind of privilege within the education system. So I'm curious to know a little more maybe some like specifics about that. You kind of alluded to like having been on this side and having been on the other side of education in terms of privilege has shaped how you interact with it. So I'd be curious to know a little bit more about that specifically as it relates to creating access and belonging. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think having the experience of having a GD and going to community college and transferring to UNC, I mean, those are actually fairly common experiences it just so happens that I kept going yeah (laughs) you know and and now I'm in this position where I kind of achieved the things I mean you know I got the tenure track job I got tenure you know I and, and I guess one of the things I've learned about academia is like it's a place that you know, pedigree is really important you know it's yeah. it's a it's a very like privileged space and so I guess that I, I've met a couple of other people that have ha- sort of had my similar story and that has been like brought tears to my eyes <laughs> like, yeah recognition and just because it is kind of this um I think for a long time maybe I felt like ashamed probably would be the best way to describe it and then maybe just you know so many people I worked with or encountered had kind of been overachievers their entire lives. And so Mm -hmm. they never like had those stumbles. Um, So I think it has both been a bit of a struggle actually to like fit that, like sort of shore that narrative up or feel like I could bring my whole self to a space or Mm -hmm. uh, sort of stitch all those parts together. Um, I think that now that I have, that's very healing. I think it also allows me like working with students, I think to, you know, be really empathetic for, you know, students, yeah. who, uh, you know, be struggling or kind of crash and burn, you know, I, that I don't, I, I mean, I can relate, you know, and I don't feel like there's a judgment there. I certainly want to mentor students and mm-hmm. ensure that they have the support they need and that that doesn't happen. But I also think it's really important to kind of be in a non-judgmental kind of role as an educator, just to understand that 
students are bringing in like so much, you know, I mean, we're, we're bringing in like all these histories and all of these personal experiences anyway. Right. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of students might be bringing in trauma, you know, the, 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 they're just, we're coming from so many different vantage points. And so just to recognize that, you know, and just to try to like, look out for the students who may not have had all of the advantages and ensure mm-hmm. that they get the same level of support or they get tapped for things you know, that their guidance is sought. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are important lessons for me. I think takeaways for me from my own life. Um, I mean, also just like, you know, to sort of get back to the whiteness piece. I mean, I mean, it's also just that like, if I didn't tell you those stories about my life, like nobody would ever suspect that. No one would be like, like, you know, I bet you didn't, you know, graduate (laughs) high school. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. In in terms of like class and race and the way those work and how those haven't been stumbling blocks for me, even though I've had stumbling blocks, those are sort of invisible to most people I meet. And so that that's another kind of lesson for me as I've gotten older and kind of reflected on that more, you know, and I guess another piece of like privilege within the Academy is also just to recognize that this is a really privileged space. And so like, what are you going to do with that? You know, like, yeah, how, right. you know, how are you going to use this information or how are you going to use your voice um, to be an advocate in other ways, uh, you know, outside of the Academy within and without, you know, um, yeah, right. Both. Yeah. So I think, I think that's been an important piece for me as well is to remember, like, this is a rarefied space. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's, let's be honest about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking in terms of stories here about how the dominant narrative or expectation is so strong that you will go to high school, you will graduate when you're 18, you will go to a four-year university, you will go on to further education, you will get a career, whatever it may be. There's this kind of like logical force behind like, this is the way things should be. Yeah. And so it's, and it's taking me back to your question too, of not if bias, but how bias is showing up. And that's one example around like, yeah, the educational privilege or the bias of Mm -hmm. people assuming that they have to follow this one path. And that's why stories are so important. Like you said, you can't have one individual be representative of a whole people because we all are individuals. So it's not you talking about your experience with non-traditional education path is not representative of everyone who's had a non-traditional education right, path. Right, not at all. But yeah. it's still meaningful for you to share that one story and mean something to everybody. You know, people who have also maybe had non-traditional paths, they're like, oh yeah, other people have gone these other routes. And despite this one story being so strong in the culture, the the truth is that that is not the one way that people get to where they want to go. Yeah. And I think the, the shame piece is really, another. yeah, I think that is really important because, you know, getting past shame and even guilt, which, you know, one of my favorite writers is Audre Lorde. And she, she writes about this, about how like, shame and guilt are like useless emotions. Yeah. <laughs> like they're natural. Like, of course you're going to feel some of those things. Mm-hmm. It's just part of like the human emotional landscape, but that there's a sort of initial emotions and you have to progress past that to get to a yeah. place that might actually, you know, be productive for you mm-hmm. and others. And especially in terms of communication. And so, um, yeah, I think about that a lot. Like, like there's no value, there's no use value. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and feeling ashamed. It's like, you know, yeah, like everybody makes mistakes or everybody has barriers or every, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's like, be honest about that. And then like, move on carrying an albatross around your neck um, about things that happened in the past is, is not only not useful to you, but it's just, it's not useful to others because mm-hmm. you're kind of burdening them as well. So I think, I think to being really honest with yourself and getting over whatever kind of shame and guilt you feel to get to a place where you can actually be in reciprocal beloved mm-hmm. community with others. I, I don't think you can really get there unless yeah. you get past your own, <laughs> you know, feelings of, of whatever about the past, or at least that's been true for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad you bring that up because I think shame is a huge part of it because the way that I understand shame or kind of visualize it is 
shame is this kind of distance between like, I think I should be over here, society, stories, mm-hmm. whoever is mm-hmm. telling me I should be over here, but I'm over here, whether that's in what my life looks like, how I actually feel about something, but I think I'm, I should feel this way is what everyone's telling me. So it's like this shame between like, trying to reconcile like what you believe to be true or what you know to be true versus what you think should be true and that is yes such a shame can be so so powerful Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and again for me this whole like meaning making is part of for me at least I'll speak to my own experience what has helped me get over shame is giving power to shame giving power to the things that we should be doing that society or stories us are telling we should be that's giving that like innate meaning. And when you can question it and tear it down a little bit and be like, oh, well, somebody else just came up with this meaning a long time ago and we accepted it. We can totally Mm -hmm. change that. Like that feels empowering. That feels like breaking through that shame into something productive rather than something that's oppressive. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think to go back to Audre Lorde, I mean, what we're talking about is sort of the way that mythical norms work to sort of, I mean, they're mystical, right? Like they're not, there's nothing that's concrete or tangible about them per se, mm-hmm. except that we've socially agreed that they, they are the norm, right? We've socially agreed that like, this is the standard by which all else will be measured. Mm-hmm. And I think that that you're absolutely right. When we have that mystical norm is the distance between whatever that mystical norm is and how we feel, right. or how we see ourselves or how we see others or what have you. And, and again, we're just reinforcing it. We're not mm-hmm. only, we're, we're we don't need somebody to oppress us. We're oppressing ourselves, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? And then that, of course, you know, we're using that same lens or framework to judge others. And so it becomes Mm -hmm. a kind of violent cycle. And so I do think um, like what you're kind of hitting on for me is just epistemology. Like, how do we know what we know? Right. Yes. Yes. let's, Let's question where we got those ideas. Um, what we, what we know to be true. Mm-hmm. is everything you know i think that is critical for communication for and and to have effective communication you need self-awareness mm-hmm. <laughs> and have that self-awareness without asking those questions yeah right And it just makes so much sense to me that in these small moments is how we create our social worlds that enough over time of me holding really firm to this story and shaming you for living differently than this story that that then we have a society, we have a social world that reflects that. But in enough moments, if we get to be authentic with each other and vulnerable with each other and share our own stories and give space for others to share their stories then we have a social world that reflects that and I think that's really meaningful and I'm thinking about I can't think of the name of the book now but I remember reading it in your class Ocean Fong's book oh yeah on earth we're briefly gorgeous yes yes and that was gorgeous I just read a novel just recently called Snow Flower and the Secret Fan and it was about these um, young women growing up in China in like the 1800s I believe talking about foot binding and marriage and all these different experiences that were so different from minor Ocean Fong's book, not experiences that I have as a white woman living in the United States in 2024. And so hearing stories, whether it is through books you're reading in class, fiction you're reading, or by being in class, I'm you know just going back to the education setting, or by working with people or engaging mm-hmm. with people in your community, you know, wherever it could be expansive, hearing stories other than your own, I think is so important for what we can believe to be possible definitely and imagination like I think it seems a little I don't want to say silly but just a little like out of place that you'd maybe think like oh well academic institutions probably aren't talking about imagination behind closed doors but it's like that's such an if you're gonna achieve inclusive excellence if you're gonna have true belonging and access for everybody if you're gonna make space for all these stories then you gotta you know have a little bit of imagination and use stories to expand your imagination of what can be for everybody yeah definitely I mean I I do think that that's the power of literature you know to or you know written literature film you know Mm -hmm. television whatever it is imaginative media I think that it is about, it can, you know, be helpful in terms of creating empathy um, Mm -hmm. for sure. But I also think it really is epistemological. It's like, 
to hear a bunch of different perspectives, then you can reflect on how you know what you know. Yeah. Um, now, that doesn't mean that every story that's out there is like accurate or, you know, relevant mm-hmm. or whatever, but it just opens up your world, you know. James Baldwin has a quote, uh, might be from The Fire Next Time, that's about uh, how, you know, it, it, that like you think your pain is singular and then you, you know, like you, you <laughs> yes. think, you know, oh, I'm like nobody's ever felt this bad about this or something. And then you, you the b- books open up your world to see mm-hmm. like a lot of these experiences are common across different cultures or time yeah. periods, all those things. So it's like, yeah, books connect you to mm-hmm. places and people that, you know, you don't necessarily have direct access to. And yeah, and in that way, I mean, it's like you can you can travel pretty deep and wide. And yeah, I, I mean, I, there, I've learned so much from imaginative literature. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like that's been a primary source of knowledge for me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going back to this like model that I've talked about of the shifting like heterarchy of context and meaning is whenever I'm reading a book or engaging with any kind of media, that's a story that is not kind of easy to relate to and like, oh, yes, well, that reflects my own experiences. So, of course, I resonate that in a lot of these other stories. It's still the the kind of highest level of context that comes out of it is this like shared humanity. Mm -hmm. I've never had that experience, but I relate to you as a fellow human being and the emotion of family and what it, all of these things and tradition and you know whatever it may be yeah I just think the imagination the shared humanity like it serves so many wonderful purposes um yeah I'm thinking about just you know taking us back to like this education setting I'm thinking that there's um many people who are listening right now I'd assume are, are no longer in school and so they can't go oh I'm gonna go sign up for an African-American studies course I'm gonna go you know learn about intersectionality in my class so I'm curious for for people who are not you know your students right now who are not students at universities right now what what kind of things would you have us know and learn or what kind of direction could you you know kind of send us down not to put the whole burden on you to teach us everything in the next 10 minutes but kind of what what would you want people to know taking away from this conversation and taking away from the things that you, you think are meaningful to leave people with? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the education is a lifelong journey, of course, and it doesn't start or end with a college degree. Um, Mm -hmm. That's just like a little stop on the road for many people, but you know, that I, I think the overarching suggestion would be to remain curious. I think often like, college is this time that it almost requires curiosity, you know, that you really need to remain curious about a lot of different things in order to make the most of it, or even to really succeed in your courses. Yeah. Um, But, you know, remain curious, like in, in all different walks, uh, you know, and throughout your life. And I mean, there's just, if you love literature, I mean, there's, there's a thousand book clubs, right? Mm-hmm. We're fortunate the library. The, yeah, the library. Um, we're so fortunate in Indianapolis to recently have all these great bookstores opening and they all have book clubs, you know, they, and even if you're not part of a club, you know, just reading on your own or mm-hmm. talking to friends and family about what you're reading. Um, you know, there's all kinds of other ways if you're not a reader to plug into different kinds of stories um, I've gotten a lot out of in Indianapolis, uh, the Spirit in Place, um, which is the Polis Center, I think. Um, but anyways, it's sort of they they run uh, dialogues, important conversations on race, powerful conversations on race is the series. And so I go to those on a monthly basis. Um, those have been fantastic. And that, those really start at like an entry level, like you don't mm-hmm. need an expert um, so that's another thing I'd recommend just on a local level. And I'll say too, you know, I'm, I'm part of but one of the most powerful groups that I'm part of right now is called Link Descendants. And it is a group that, you know, if you are the descendant of the enslaved or you are a descendant of an enslaver or just white people that may have been involved in Jim Crow or some kind of you know, anti-Native American violence, whatever it is, it's a place that sort of brings all of us together. And so I've been part of that group for a couple of years and I'm the leader of a writing pod in that group. And 
you know, that is, that is really powerful. Yeah, I bet. You know, it's about truth and reckoning, but it's also about reparations. You know, it's, it's really important work. So, I mean, if you can kind of, that's for me, that I mentioned that, you know, finding portals of purpose kind of outside professional sphere per se. And and for Mm -hmm. me, that's one of mine, you know, which is sort of like, um, that's a space of incredible learning of, you know, definitely being curious, a place of building beloved community, uh, but also obviously always talking about really difficult and sometimes kind of traumatic experiences. So um, yeah, like find your portal (laughs) through which you can continue to self-educate and part of educational communities um, and and just remain curious. And when you remain curious, I think those portals keep opening up, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're open to them, you know, they, they sort of find you. Mm-hmm. What I'm hearing at the heart of, I think like a lot of what we've said today is this like engagement piece, like engage and get involved in whatever that looks like. And I'm thinking of um, someone I spoke to recently talking about building relationships specifically. Um, his name's John Stewart and he's a communication scholar. And he wrote a book recently, uh, Dismantling Racism One-on-One. And he's mm-hmm. talking about what happens in our relationships. And he makes these distinctions about, you know, the distinction I want to talk about is he's talking about invitations and offerings. And he uses that uh, inviting and offering feelings and inviting and offering choices and like the way we communicate with each other. But that piece is so important that it's an invitation. And also, so, you know, you can invite someone into conversation with you and invite them to be vulnerable, invite them to share their story, but you also need to like offer something. So it is that like shared where we're in this together kind of thing. And so I think that engagement pieces really important and really good place to start because it can be really easy. I think for people, especially I'll say probably white people to like opt out of engaging Mm -hmm. in conversations about anti-racism, intersectionality, bias, because you feel like you can, or because Mm -hmm. the barrier to entry feels like, but but I just don't know how to have those conversations. Or what if I say the wrong thing? You know, people can talk themselves out of those conversations really easily. Mm -hmm. And so the, the memory or the um, thing for people to keep with them is that there's a lot of avenues to engage. And there's, again, a lot of like intentionality to be had in these conversations that make it so like you can engage and it can be meaningful. Yeah. And I think what you're hitting on is important in terms of that engagement, like be radically vulnerable, you know, like take a risk and, you know, it's not going to pay off every time, but it will pay pay off, right? Like taking, taking, you have to take a risk. You have to be vulnerable in order to build meaningful relationships and I guess I take a lot from do you know Layla Saad the podcaster and writer um, I don't you know, she has a a kind of um, concept I guess about ancestorship and so she calls it um, being a good ancestor and I think that is maybe a way to think about it like you know, if you're working on being a good ancestor, then, you know, you're kind of, that's like an ongoing process Mm -hmm. of, you know, whether you had good ancestors or not, Yeah. (laughs) you know, you're, you're working on it in the here and now and with that future orientation, um, again, not with like shame and guilt, but just like, how can I be a good ancestor now? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that is such a positive framing, um, that that can help you remain kind of curious and engaged, yeah. vulnerable and all of those things, because, you know, you have this kind of goal in mind um, and it's, you know, and it's a really kind of noble aspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Emily, this, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And as we wrap up, I like to kind of offer a chance to recap some of what we've talked about today using some CMM language, which is, I've already kind of used, you know, this idea of like better social worlds. And so the last question I'd like to ask is, you know, what, what is your idea of a better social world and how is all this work helping us move towards that? Yeah, I think a better social world is um, horizontal power sharing, you know, mm, yeah, yeah. People, or a hierarchy. Um, I think it's where we can be living in um an environment that's framed by truth and reckoning and and not fear of the past where we can accept it and also look forward in in a sort of inspired way. Mm. Um, you know, again, to think about uh, James Baldwin, who I just love. And so he, he always has like the perfect quote for everything. 
Um, but you know, he talks about like you to face your history doesn't mean drowning in it. Mm. And so think about a, a social world that's like unafraid of facing the past. Um, mm. And that really is is able to do that honestly, while also you know looking forward to liberated futures. Yeah, that well, I, I think that's a great definition and a great place to end. So seriously, thank you so much for this conversation today and your time. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was so great to talk to you, and yeah. I hope to talk to you soon. Okay, that is all for our conversation with Emily. At the end of each episode, I like to offer questions to reflect on, which act as a next turn so the conversation doesn't stop just because the episode does. Today, the questions I would have you think about are, where can you find paths to engagement? How can you redefine excellence for yourself? And what would it look like for you to embrace curiosity in your own life and stories? You are always welcome to reach out to me to share your reflections on those questions, as well as any of your own questions or ideas. You can do that through email, the website, by commenting on Instagram or YouTube, and by commenting on the CMM Institute Substack. Links to all those are in the show notes. The reason I invite you to share your reflections with me is to stay in dialogue. Other great ways to keep dialogue going is to follow the show wherever you listen, leave a rating and review, share this episode with someone you want to invite into the conversation. And I already mentioned that Substack. That's a really great place for us to be engaging as a community. So again, I'll point you in that direction. I am supported by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is just one of many initiatives designed to move us toward better social worlds through better communication. You can learn more about the CMM Institute and our other initiatives at the links I have in the show notes. One that I'll point out right now is our Cosmo Activities line of social emotional resources. We have a new home, new website, which is www.cosmoactivities.com. Those resources are available for free, perfect for teachers, educators, and also parents, anyone who works with children. Those are available to download for free, but also some of those activities are now available as interactive online activities. So there's lots of excitement going on over there. And as it is back to school time and the theme of this month is education, I think this is very fitting to point you over there. Again, that's www.cosmoactivities.com. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious. And thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby. And this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told.